We all know the name Professor Stephen Hawking, regarded as one of the best scientists of all time. He spent his career focused on understanding space, the cosmos, and the origins of the universe. And he had a fascination with answering humanity's biggest questions. In 2016, two years before he died, he said this, I would like nuclear fusion to become a practical power source. It would provide an inexhaustible supply of energy without pollution or global warming. So what is Professor Hawking talking about? Fusion, inexhaustible energy. Well, fusion is the process that powers the sun and the stars. It's the process by which, under the right conditions of high temperature, two light atomic elements, such as hydrogen, combine together, fusing and releasing energy in the process. And in fact, here it is another scientist that is important, Albert Einstein and his famous equation E equals mc squared. To simply explain this equation, in the process of fusion, matter is converted into energy. Now you can explain E equals mc squared. So nuclear fusion is actually the opposite of nuclear fission. Fission is the splitting of one unstable heavy atomic nucleus, a heavy elements such as uranium, into lighter ones. Fusion is joining of light ones together. Now, like fission, fusion does not produce any emissions or greenhouse gases. Unlike fission, however, fusion is inherently safe. There's no risk of a runaway reaction or a meltdown, and there's no production of long-lived high-level radioactive waste. Furthermore, fusion fuel sources on Earth are essentially unlimited. One can be produced from seawater, the other produced from lithium, both of which are abundant and widespread. And it's for these reasons that fusion has been regarded for over 100 years as the holy grail of energy, creating a star on Earth. So why do we need this clean, inexhaustible energy? Well, simply, energy underpins absolutely everything that humans do. And actually, there's a direct correlation between access to energy and the quality of human life. Climate change looms. We need to move away from a carbon-based economy and stop emitting greenhouse gases and pollution into our environment. We need energy security, to be not reliant on foreign supplies of energy. And this is true for every country in the world. Now, importantly, we have to remember that energy is not just about clean electricity. Aviation, shipping, industrial processes, as well as growing food and producing clean water, these are not things that are easy to electrify. Fusion can help uniquely in these areas. Imagine a world where access to clean and abundant energy was no longer a concern. With fusion, we can think not just 50 years into the future, but 500 or even 5,000 years ahead. It's the energy source, it's the ultimate energy source. Clean power, abundant energy, forever, everywhere. Okay, that sounds really great. So why don't we have fusion on Earth yet? I, I chose my words quite carefully there because we do actually orbit a massive fusion reactor in the sky, the sun, about 93 million miles away. So it turns out, perhaps quite unsurprisingly to all of you, that bringing a star to Earth is a little bit challenging. So in, the, in a star, the conditions are actually right for fusion to occur naturally. However, on Earth, we have to simulate these conditions. Now, how do we go about doing this? We're going to go on a bit of a science lesson. So we have to produce something called a plasma. Now, a plasma is the fourth state of matter. It's what happens when you heat up a gas. When you heat up a gas to a plasma, the electrons from outside the element are dissociated, leaving only the positively charged atomic nucleus. Now, the goal of fusion is to make this atomic nucleus collide with another nucleus. But as I said, they're positively charged. And remember from school, magnets repel each other if they have the same charge. Same effect here. So we have to overcome that. And we do this by producing a plasma that is hot enough, dense enough, and that can last for long enough. Specifically for fusion on Earth, using the fuels that we're planning to use, we have to get it to temperatures of between 100 million and 200 million degrees Celsius. Really quite hot. We then have to either make it dense enough and or lasting for long enough, so holding it there. Are you still with me? Okay. So the point, actually, these three values are really important. 
because the product of these three values, if you get that above a certain threshold, you produce more power from the fusion reaction than you put in to creating it, getting it hot enough, dense enough, and lasting for long enough. In fusion, we call this moment break-even, fusion power break-even, but I'll refer to it just as break-even. So to put this in another way, the best way to describe fusion power break-even is actually by Professor Dennis White of MIT, who a few years ago said, this moment of break-even for fusion would be like the Kitty Hawk moment. What was he talking about? Well, he's referring to the moment in 1903 by the Wright brothers at which they first achieved manned flight. This was the exact moment that the wheels were off the ground and we knew it was possible. And actually, since the 1950s, when fusion research really took off, this is what we've been trying to do, achieve break-even and push beyond, harnessing the energy, creating this energy source. So this is a reactor from the 1950s, uh, one of the first, and people tried various ways of producing fusion plasmas, typically using really powerful magnets to confine, lasers to compress, um, or a combination of both in some cases. Now, early on in the program, while some reactors looked like they were promising, one stood out in particular, a device called a tokamak, a rather sci-fi sounding name, which is essentially a donut-shaped plasma surrounded by magnets. And over from the 1960s onwards, the tokamak took center stage, and tens of these were built all over the world, each of us pushing us closer and closer to break even. The most famous of these tokamaks is actually just about 50 to 60 miles away from where I'm standing right now, called the JET tokamak, which stands for Joint European Taurus. Now, in the 1990s, JET got two thirds of the way to break even, and actually reached this again very recently, re re recreated the same results. Now, it's actually quite amazing that one of the hottest places in the known universe is just outside Oxford, right? That's quite cool. So JET sort of showed us that that is the way and that break-even was just the next step, that we're just on that path. And indeed, that next step was already planned. In the 1980s, uh, a, collaboration, a collaboration agreement between several nations, including India, China, Japan, Russia, the United States, the European Union, South Korea, and the USA, was to build this large fusion reactor that would push us to break-even and beyond. It would thus provide us the way to fusion energy. And ITER is Latin for the way. So we must have fusion energy by now, right? We've done break even and now we've learned how to take the energy out. Well, unfortunately not. Due to a number of reasons, ITER was delayed first to the 2010s, then to the 2020s, and now it won't turn on with full power operations until the late 2030s. So ostensibly, despite that strong progress in the 1900s towards 2000, the trajectory has stalled, and we're waiting for ITER. Well, perhaps not. So over the past decade or so, a number of fusion startups have emerged, over 20, in fact, based all around the world. These companies, typically spinning out of government laboratories or universities, are led by scientists and engineers who spent their careers working on fusion, who want to do things a bit differently. These companies are focused on a variety of different techniques, some are working on tokamaks and known technologies and bringing the two together. Others are working on new physics with existing technologies. And some are working on new physics and new technologies together. Some key examples of this. New magnets that are more powerful and that can hold a longer and stabler plasma have been developed. New laser systems, including one that won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2018 by Professor Donna Strickland, are now being employed to try and improve plasma performance and a range of AI to understand what happens in a plasma and try and move to the next steps are now being deployed as well. So these companies are privately funded. And in fact, maybe that private funding is an indication of the serious potential of fusion energy because almost five billion US dollars has been invested into fusion over the past few years. With the largest companies, seven of them having raised over $100 million each, and the largest two having raised over $1 billion, uh, sorry, $1 billion and $2 billion, respectively. What's most interesting, however, is that all of these companies are suggesting that they can accelerate the time to fusion energy. And some of them are targeting break-even within the next few years, and then commercialization of fusion energy around a decade or so from now. Wow. How is, how is that possible? And what about ITER? Well, ITER is a scientific project. 
Its mission is to develop and understand science, fusion science, and, and technology. What we have to remember with ITER is that it's an international project of various, government, um, various governments working together. It cannot tolerate a high risk of failure. So ITER fundamentally has to be delayed. Startups are doing things a bit differently. They're trying to work faster with unknown technology and they're, li they're limited by the finite private capital that they've got. So they have to proceed with risk and faster. It's a fundamental change in mindset. So one of these changes is that the ITER mission, whilst focused on this, we're seeing a paradigm shift now in fusion energy. The way startups are doing things is a bit different. Historically, technologies have been developed on what's called a linear model of innovation. This is where typically science is first understood before we understand the technology and develop it into a product. We focus on that bit later. What we see with fusion startups is having to jump to the application and getting the science to come later. Now this is a paradigm shift moment because it's the way we approach that innovation itself. Perhaps the most obvious example of where this happens is in the Apollo man mission to Mars, uh, to the moon, sorry, not to Mars, not yet. So the man mission to the moon. But there's actually a more recent example, the development of COVID-19 vaccines. Here, we saw the development of new technology, new vaccines, whilst actually alongside it, we had to develop the supply chain, the manufacturing, and the rollout model for those vaccines to be put needles in arms whilst we were developing the technology that we weren't sure was gonna work. So we taught, saw two, two things happen simultaneously here. Development of unknown technology, alongside preparing of the next steps. With this approach, could fusion be next? Well, this is what those startups are doing. They're working now together with the, private se with the public sector and industry to start planning the next steps whilst focusing on that technology. What we're seeing in fusion now is a new ecosystem, a new status quo. I think possibly in the next five years, we could see break even. And thereafter, the road to fusion, we're already solving those challenges. The mission remains the same, but the game has changed and so have the players. Realizing Stephen Hawking's dream of a clean energy future to power the world of tomorrow and beyond, or perhaps it's not as far away as we think. Thank you.